All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation. Uh, the primary focus of my talk today uh, is to, to discuss with you about our recent progress, which is uh, mostly in the molecular basis for hypoxia-induced endothelial barrier dysfunction. Uh, hopefully, by understanding the underlying mechanism of this process, we can design a more uh, rational-based uh, treatment to uh, deal with uh, this kind of metabolic problems. Right. So, as uh, already introduced by several excellent talks uh, in this conference over the last two days, I guess uh, all of you now are convinced that uh, many known endothelial functions are mediated by nitric oxide. As illustrated in the diagram here, uh, nitric oxide actually is produced by endothelium through the enzyme named endothelium anosynthase. Uh, you can call it enose or anose 3 uh, uh, as shown here. So it has been shown clearly that uh, when nitric oxide is produced by endothelium, it can diffuse to the bloodstream. Over there, it can suppress the aggregation of platelets. So this is one of the major functions that has been known uh, through a non-mediated process. And the other anode-mediated important function is that uh, nitric oxide can diffuse to the other side of, of endothelium in vessels, which uh, reach to the smooth muscle cells. So inside smooth muscle cells, NO can target on a very clearly defined signaling pathway. So that is it, it's shown in the second slide here. It has been described clearly that uh, nitric oxide can target on uh, good uh, guanine cyclase. So this process is a so-called second GMP dependent pathway. This is very classical and uh, all the intermediate steps have been already uh, illustrated by many excellent literatures. So the downstream signalings would lead to uh, many uh, enzymes in the activated forms. So those enzymes would uh, act coordinately to regulate things like smooth muscle relaxation and uh, vasodilation as well as uh, platelet inhibition. So this is uh, well defined and uh, by showing such kind of process, these three uh, great scientists were awarded Nobel Prize back in 1998. On the other hand, the less well characterized signaling pathways mediated by nitric oxide is on the right hand side, which is a second GMP independent pathway. So over the last 10 years or so, we were particularly interested in one type of protein uh, post-translational modifications by nitric oxide, which is cysteine as nitrous station. In particular, we want to ask whether inside endothelial proteins are also targeted by nitric oxide to form this type of uh, s nitro station. So why NO signaling is so important inside endothelia? Perhaps we can use this slide to illustrate the concept. So uh, as you probably know that uh, uh, when the plaque is formed in the blood vessel due to the uh, consumption of high fat diet or the lack of exercise, the blood flow here will be perturbed. Sometimes it's uh, perturbed seriously. So if that happens, it will create the hypoxic environment inside the blood vessel. One of the hallmark of hypoxia region here is the increased uh, barrier dysfunction of endothelia. So that would lead to the increased permeability shown here. And one of the known uh, cofactors associated with hypoxia-induced barrier dysfunction is the decreased nitric oxide production by endothelia. So there seems to be a nice correlation between decreased NO production and hypoxia-induced barrier dysfunction. So if we take a close look on what happens inside hypoxic packet here, uh, starting from the left-hand side, as I already pointed out, there is a decreased NO production in response to hypoxia. Then following that, it will be the increased permeability. So you will see that uh, leukocytes uh, now is getting infiltrated inside, uh, 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 sorry, inside the blood. 
And uh, as the consequence, there will be apoptosis or thrombosis occurred inside blood, uh, the blood tissues. So this is, in fact, the hallmark of uh, development in atherosclerosis. If we put uh, those events in, uh, in a sequence order here, roughly we can say that uh, endothelial barrier dysfunction would uh, uh, occur quite early on. Then the inflammation would follow. Then you will see the smooth muscle cell proliferation, tissue remodeling. In the end, you will see the uh, occurrence of atherosclerosis. So now, back several years ago, uh, we identified that uh, the activation of caspase 3 which is a system-mediated enzyme, seemed to play a key role in the development of hypoxia-induced uh, uh, endothelial barrier dysfunction. So as illustrated in this data, uh, we used the MS1 endothelia, which is uh, isolated from mouse. You can see that in response to hypoxia, uh, the permeability is now increased dramatically. When we have the caspase 3 inhibitor, which is the DVD here, now the permeability goes back to the normal level. If you look at the cell morphology, now you can see pretty much the same thing. In response to hypoxia, now the barrier uh, is pretty much uh, disrupted. And uh, in the presence of uh, caspase 3 inhibitor, now the morphology looks pretty normal. Okay, so then back to the nitric oxide mediated process. We were thinking that uh, uh, caspase 3 may be one of the targets uh, recognized by nitric oxide. So why is that? Based on the biochemical study or structural study, it has been shown that uh, caspase 3, just like uh, tyrosine phosphatase, as uh, for us pointed out, those enzymes are system-based enzymes. So they share a very common character, which is a low pKa. Okay. So this low pKa character is very important for the catalysis. So the system must function as a nucleophile in the first process of uh, protein cleavage. However, this character also renders uh, those enzymes highly susceptible to uh, oxidation or nitrostation. So this is really the problem coming from. Because of that, we uh, propose such a hypothesis. Perhaps under the normoxic condition, caspase 3 is constitutively acenitrostated, so that would keep the enzyme in the inactive form. In response to hypoxia, if there is a loss of anode production, those acenitrostated caspase 3 may be reduced back to the active form. So that may be a process leading to the increased permeability or endothelial barrier dysfunction. So to prove uh, such, such idea, we used the typical biotin switch method, which was developed by Jeffrey and colleagues back in uh, early 2000. So the basic idea here is that uh, we use uh, arcuating reagent to block all the reduced system in the first place. Then we use escobate uh, plus the other system tag that uh, would, uh, uh, would make the original s nitrosylated cysteine now tagged by uh, whatever the, the chemical uh, reagent that they want to use. So in the end, we can use either the biochemical method or the mass spect based method to see whether uh, the cysteine residue in our interest is uh, s nitrosylated or whether the label could be changed. So this is the result we got. In response to hypoxia, now we see the decreased SNO level of caspase 3. So this is the endogenous SNO level of caspase 3 in MS1 cells. So for the quantitative analysis, now you can see a very clear decrease in the SNO level. So that uh, leads to the second hypothesis. Now, in response to hypoxia, we already know that uh, caspase 3 will be denitrosylated, so that uh, activated. Then the next question is whether we can use any uh, treatment that may produce bioactive NO under the hypoxic situation. So that hopefully, ho hopefully can re rebound this denitrosylated caspase 3 back to the s nitrosylated form. If that is the case, caspase activity can be regulated. So for this, we went to the literature and uh, we found that uh, nitrite uh, 
which has been used extensively in many studies, especially in the cardiovascular diseases. Now, nitrite may be a good candidate because under hypoxic condition, it has been proposed that uh, nitrite would function as a resource of bioactive NO through the conversion uh, by the endogenous nitrite reductase. In fact, if you look into the literature, it has been shown that uh, people among the world, including Asia, like in ancient China, <coughs> started to use nitrite or nitrate as a drug to treat uh, acute uh, coronary artery disease, which is heart attack. And uh, this article was uh, identified uh, 10, 20 years ago, but uh, the record was already preserved more than 1,000 years in China. It says that uh, nitrate, which is the further oxidized form of nitric oxide, nitrate was used in uh, ancient China to cure those patients who suffer from the uh, heart attack. Okay. You, can, you can go back to read all the details here. But uh, interestingly, recent studies support such a, a very early observation by uh, our ancestors, suggesting that uh, under hypoxic condition, nitrite can be reduced to bioactive nitrate oxide through, as I said, a, a varieties of endogenous nitrate reductases. So by knowing that, uh, we decided to check whether nitrate treatment in hypoxic endothelia would work on CASP3. So the first experiment we did here is to use EPR method to measure the nitric oxide released from uh, endothelia under hypoxic stress. So you can see here, in response to increased level of nitrite we added to the culture, there is a dose-dependent production of nitric oxide under hypoxic conditions. So that gave us the, uh, the confidence to check how is the changes of as nitrostation levels on CASP3. Again, through the Belting switch method, now you can see that uh, consistently in response to hypoxia, CASP now is in a denitrostated form. With the supplement of nitrite here, now CASP3 goes back to the nitrostated, therefore inactivated form. And the dose seems to be quite critical. If you use higher dose of nitrite, that may not be beneficial. All right, so we, we then use the mass spec uh, best analysis to prove that the catalytic cysteine of CASP3, which, uh, which is cysteine 163, is the primary target of nitrite mediated anode production under uh, the hypoxic condition. So I won't go through the details because this is a pretty much uh, similar as the belting switch method I just introduced to you. Just uh, looking at the data here by LC MS MS analysis. Now we are able to show that uh, the supplement of nitrite to the hypoxic endothelias would uh, increase the s nitrostation level of cysteine 136, suggesting that uh, the catalytic cysteine is indeed the primary target of nitrite mediated and no production. So then we go back to the bio, uh, biofunctional assays. Here, when we look at permeability, now hypoxia induced uh, increased permeability is reduced by the treatment of nitrite. You can see the same thing in the morphology. This is hypoxic cells with nitrite treatment. Now everything looks pretty normal. Okay, so this is the summary uh, of uh, mechanisms we obtained from MS1 cells. So nitrite indeed produced bioactive form of NO that uh, <coughs> push CASP3 back to the s stated form. So we repeat the same experiments in other types of endothelia. In this experiment, we use uh, bovine aortic endothelia bags. So we did the same thing for biotin switch method. Now, reproducibly, in response to hypoxia, you can see the de decrease of SNO level on CASP3. Nitrite bring it back. In the permeability assay, you see the same thing. So obviously, nitrite works in bags as well. The other primary endothelia is Hubex, which are popularly used by many uh, labs. So here, we look at uh, the adherent junctions by examining the weak adherent mediated uh, uh, cell-cell adhesion by immunofluorescence. 
So you just look at what happens in response to hypoxia. If you look at the enlarged view here, so hypoxia would lead to the disruption of uh, uh, VK3 mediated cell junctions, which is uh, reproducible uh, from many literatures already reported. The interesting things here is that uh, in response to nitrite treatment, now you can see that the disruption of adherent junctions is pretty much reversed back, suggesting that uh, even under hypoxia, uh, if you have enough nitrite or if you have the good dose, right dose of nitrite, that uh, would maintain the cell cell uh, adhering. And that is very important to keep the permeability. So in the end, we also use an animal model, uh, which is the uh, zebrafish embryos, to look at the in vivo evidence of nitrite-mediated uh, suppression of permeability. So uh, as you probably know, uh, zebrafish is a very nice model if you want to look at the uh, vascular functions, because in the embryo stage, zebrafish is pretty much transparent. So if you have uh, <coughs> the transgenic fish in which endothelia is tagged, in GFP, so you can see it under microscopy. Right. So now, the green colors here indicates the network of vessels. So what we did here is that uh, we inject the, the red fluorescence tagged tracer to the circulation. In response to hypoxia, now you can see that uh, those tracers would uh, diffuse out from the vessels, suggesting that uh, vessels now are in uh, higher permeability. You can see that in the enlarged view here. With the nitrite uh, supplement to the, to the water, basically, now you can see that uh, majority of the tracers will be confined back to the vessel. Okay? And we did the quantitative analysis, and that indicating pretty similar results as uh, cell-based experiments. Hypoxia induced the permeability, whereas nitrite treatment uh, bring it back to the normal level. So in the end, this is the summary from the studies uh, I just introduced to you. In response to hypoxia, CASP3 is denitrosylated and activated. We also identify one of the substrate is beta catenin So this beta catenin will be cleaved by CASP3. As the consequence, uh, the v cadherin uh, <coughs> complex will be disrupted, so that uh, in fact, leads to the observation of increased permeability. As I already said, nitrite produced bioactive NO, so that bring back the s nitrostatic form of CASP3. So everything seems to be normal under the nitrite treatment. So majority of the data uh, have been published in circulation research just uh, recently. So if you are interested in the details, you can go to take a look. Then the, the current uh, focus would be certainly moving, moving from the one particular target of nitric oxide to the broad range of all system-mediated proteins in endothelia. So this is a recent review to summarize majority of the thio uh, enzymes being identified so far. So you can see that many, many enzymes, some of them may be out of our previous understanding, are system mediated. And we, in the conference here, we discussed two groups of those enzymes, phosphatases and the proteases. And we also uh, explained why phosphatases such as tyrosine phosphatase or case, uh, proteases such as caspase can be targeted by nitric oxide because of the low PK character I just mentioned to you. So now the question in hand is, so out of so many enzymes, uh, mediated by system, how, how many of them or the percentage of them would be targeted by nitrite mediated NO production? Okay. So before we look for the, the massive uh, mass spect based global uh, identifications, we did some imaging work. So this imaging work may give us uh, some hint whether such a process is a global event or that is a very specific event. So what we did here is that uh, <coughs> we use uh, multiple uh, steps of archivation to pretty much remove all the reduced system 
when we carry out the immunofluorescence uh, experiments. So here we have hydrophobic alkylating reagent marked as X, and we have hydrophobic alkylating reagent uh, labeled with Y here. So in, by two steps of alkylation, majority of the, the cysteines in the reduced form should be already uh, taken care. Then the remaining cysteine now would be s natural form. So for this, we follow the typical idea to use s that's that supposed to be specific for s, -nat s natural stated cysteine. So s would re reduce s natural, s -natural stated cysteine. At the same time, we have the third uh, alkylating reagent, which is marked as Z here. So this Z would take an S uh, no, uh, modified system. So in the end, the protein would look like this form. So the innovative uh, method we applied here is to create a specific antibody which recognize the Z tagged system. So by using this antibody, so we, we hope to reduce the background and enhance the specific signal here. So using BEC as a model, now we are, we are able to show that uh, under normoxic condition, indeed, there are so many proteins inside cells are uh, S-natural stated constitutively. And interestingly, in response to hypoxia, now we can see a global decrease of uh, SNO signal, suggesting that many proteins, not only caspase 3 are reduced. And remarkably, when we have nitrite treatment there, now you can see that the decreased SNO level is back under hypoxia condition. So obviously, there will be much more proteins uh, rather than just caspase 3 will be the, the targets for our follow-up study. So right now, this is the question in our mind. Are additional NO-targeted cysteine proteases involved in hypoxic injury? So I guess more than proteases, there should be other things, perhaps including phosphatases, also involved in this process. But uh, I don't have any time to show you the mass spec approach today. So hopefully uh, sometime soon, I can present some new data and tell you more targets of system mediated enzymes in this context. So now back to the, the major focus of this uh, conference, why we need vegetables. I think this is very obvious that uh, vegetables provide us the bioactive nitrate and the nitrite. So without uh, those uh, consumption of vegetables, we probably do not have enough uh, no precursors. So that would create problems uh, with uh, cardiovascular systems. <coughs> so in the end, I'd like to thank two individuals in the lab. Yan Chun was uh, the previous PhD student. She did all the works uh, in uh, endothelia uh, in response to hypoxic stress. And she's in... Uh, uh, Mark Gladwin's lab in Pittsburgh as a poster. And Mingfo developed the imaging system. And that is a very powerful uh, methodology for us to look at the global change inside sales. And uh, I have uh, local collaborators, international collaborators, and also thank for the funding sources. All right, thank you for your attention. Yes. Um, I've got a comment and then a question. Yeah. So the comment is that many of your methods yeah. using the biotin switch technique yeah. have a lot of uh, potential weaknesses for the biotin switch. Mm -hmm. Is that it's just identifying modified proteins. But the critical point, which I think yeah. uh, is absolutely essential and why there's such a misleading lot of information in the S naturalization and translation. Yes. Yes. Is you need to quantify the yeah. extent. Yeah. For the caspase 3, for example, you yeah. can actually show that it's modified. Mm -hmm. You can show many other proteins are modified. Sure. But as far as I can tell from the data shown, yeah. you can tell whether it's 0.1% modified yeah. exactly. or whether it's 50% yeah. modified. Yeah. And I think methods have been developed yeah. which we can actually quantify exactly the modification system as you can. Yeah. I think that's absolutely essential. I think the biosource technique and yeah. is a starting point with the need to move on to quantification in my opinion. Yeah. That I totally agree. Otherwise, yes. there's a danger that's caused. Yep. Yep. That's the comment. Mm -hmm. The question, 
What do you think is the species that transfers the nitrosodium onto the phylate in the presence of nitrite? What is the species? That transfers the nitrosodium onto the phylate, because obviously nitric oxide can't do it. Yeah. What's the actual chemical reaction that's occurring yeah. to modify this caspase phylate or whatever? All right, so from the, <laughs> yeah, from the biochemical view, uh, I think it's a not enzymatic reaction. But uh, in the real biological system, I, the answer is I don't know. So if you do the in vitro experiment, you have, uh, for example, purified caspase 3 or purified PDP1B together with uh, nitric oxide source. Now you can see obviously those uh, low PKA cysteines will be targeted without any enzymes to assist. But inside cells, we, we suspect that uh, transnitrostation may be more promising reaction compared to the spontaneous chemical reaction. So that's uh, our current thinking. But uh, I guess different people may have different views. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The nitrites and nitrates yeah. in vegetables yeah. vis a vis nitrosamine formation. So, the downside, of course, of high nitrite yeah. or nitrate consumption will be nitrosamine formation in the gut, which sure. will increase carcinogenic uh, yeah. risk. Yeah. So, could you, could you address that issue of how much um, nitrite and nitrate is active in fruits and vegetables that would be sure. valuable for prophylaxis or, or therapy without inducing carcinogenic risk? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, being asked by many people. So uh, I just uh, uh, came back from Pittsburgh uh, last month for a nitrite and nitrate conference. So, so right now, just over the last two years, there were a few clinical trials in the States and in Europe uh, to define clearly uh, what would be the beneficial dose of nitrate and the nitrite to, to human beings. So I guess roughly uh, the level of nitrate in the bloodstream uh, will be somewhere between uh, one millimolar to 10 millimolar. This is what I heard from many talks in the conference. So they would consider such levels are beneficial. And uh, many experiments using uh, vegetables, uh, for example, the, the beetroot juice, that, that, that's a very popular uh, experimental approach right now. So I guess human beings uh, would uh, digest uh, the juice from the, this kind of vegetable easily. So, so immediately after the drink of such a juice, they, they take the blood and measure the nitrate and the nitrite level. I think they will roughly get uh, such kind of level. But higher than that, certainly that will be harmful. <laughs>